welcome. Hi there, I'm Barbara Tapp and I'm an Australian but I live in Berkeley, California and I am crazy about watercolours. And today I'm going to introduce you to a discovery that I made when I attended a Watercolour Live program in January 22 and I had an aha moment and I want to share with you this journey or the results of this journey that I've made focusing on this and the radical impact that it's had in, to my work. I was originally uh, born in Sydney, Australia and I grew up on the harbour and I'm mad about the water, a sailor. My father was an architect and he also did watercolours uh, when he was on vacation so I had an early exposure to watercolours and Eventually, when I went to interior design after graduating from school, I had one semester in architectural rendering and in it learnt to run watercolour washes and found them to be so interesting, particularly when I learnt about shadows in architecture. And I've rekindled that interest that was born, I guess, back in the 70s from the blues that are reflected from the sky into the shadows. And it's, it's very common in architectural rendering that we will use all our eave shadows from the roof in the color blue. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this video telling you a little bit about what I do. I'm going to have demonstrations throughout it about how you look for the shadow shapes and the values of the shadow shapes. So let's get on with it. I've always had intent wherever I paint, asking questions and finding answers. I'm an observer of life and I like to search and paint for stories. My pathway of discovery led me to a question about shadows. Shadows are silhouettes cast behind an object from the light hitting the object in one direction. How could I capture the initial shadows that I see if I follow the watercolour process of painting from light to dark? I was getting frustrated painting plein air because after two to three hours of working from my paler layers, often the sun, my light source, had moved and the shadows were gone and I could not see or remember the shadows even though I'd sketched them in my sketchbook. Also, I added them in at the end of the painting and they often turned muddy and blurred having added them over the washes below. Why not put them in at the beginning of the painting instead of the end? Placing the shadow shapes in my painting secures them in my composition and allows me to play off those shapes as I build the painting around them. The shadow shapes can be expressive directional strokes full of energy which brings texture to my painting. Strong shadows are very appealing to me and they assist in defining form and volume in my paintings. I love colour distortion and fascinating variations of shadows and the way that they occur across and around objects. I love perspective. The more complicated the perspective, the more interested I am in the subject. Any light source can create a shadow shape outside or indoors from the sunlight or incandescent light. With my shadow shapes defined, I can see where to save my white areas I don't use any additional masking or product to preserve my whites. I like them to naturally occur as I see them in my scenes. My second question was, how could this affect or how would it affect the rest of my painting? Would I be able to run wet on wet washes after the shadow shapes were in and also preserve my whites? Please join me as we explore the results of placing shadows and darks first. For me, paintings with high contrast of values is very stimulating. And we, after all, as artists, we're trying to create something that we like and that we want to see. Shadow shapes are dynamic. They vary in colour and move in all sorts of directions, depending on the light source at the time. I encourage you, after you've seen this video, to go out and take a look at the various shadow shapes that you can see. There are spectacular ones that are cast from clouds when you're flying in an aeroplane. There are amazing architectural forms that projected from poles on buildings up and over the surfaces, round objects, 
uh, also cast very interesting oval shadows. We will explore this technique with various short demonstrations and a completed painting. I will discuss pre-sketching, simple perspective, design and editing, values, shadow shapes and shadow colours. Starting with shadow shapes and darks first, both in plein air and studio watercolours, will open new doors towards creativity and experimentation. I'm really actually very excited to share this approach. It's completely changed the direction of my watercolour process. I hope it will yield dynamic, bold watercolours full of contrast, textures and light. And I hope you will contact me further to chat about experiments and results. I have a fascination through observation asking questions. You don't necessarily have to have a reason, you just need to know that you react and are excited by something that you are thinking about and have to explore, experiment and finally paint about it. So now we're going to start a uh, section of this where I introduce the colour blue into my shadow shapes. Why did I choose the colour blue? Um, I think I've answered that a couple of times, just it's the reflected colour of the sky. It's also quite uh, dynamic in the paintings and you can paint over it and still see it with a wash. So I would like to introduce you to my watercolours that I'm choosing. This is a cobalt blue, uh, just showing you the value difference that you can generate, a very simple um, example. Uh, then I use an ultramarine, which has a little bit more intense, brighter blue to it. I use an indanthrin, and then I use indigo. To each colour that I've mentioned above, there is a value that ranges from, if you want to say, from a dark to a light. The dark is the full pigment with limited water, if not straight out of the tube to the white and in between are the values that give life to the, set, the shadows. I'd like to do a little demonstration using a cube to show the different values on, um, in shadows. And this same theory gets applied to when I'm isolating my shadows. So the sh I don't want you to think that shadows are just one blue. They're not. They can have a, a lot of contrast and variation in them. And that's what makes my paintings even more complex. So I'm going to start with the uh, cobalt here. And my light source is coming from here, this direction. And I have very little pigment on this surface because the light is hitting it. Then the light is coming from above on my object. So intensified the pigment just a bit. And then to describe this elevation of the box, I make the shadow a little bit darker. Oops. And then the last one is practically full pigment. So this is in complete shadow, the light source being here, the box being uh, covering up all the light source. The variation on the, of the pigment on the different planes creates form. And that's what I'm looking for in <coughs> when I'm putting in my shadow shapes. 
So we're going to do an exercise that shows that you can have shadows even though there's not a reflected uh, or silhouetted shadow shape cast behind an object. Um, this means that you can look at, here's my subject, it's aloe plants and it, uh, it shows that there are shadows within shadows and this is a nice little exercise but I'm just going to isolate some of the areas quickly with a, a pencil and then I'll just this is a way that you can actually um, it's positive and negative painting but shadows as I say don't have to be just reflected behind an object just because the objects blocking the source of light all these leaves are blocking the source of light and consequently creating a very nice uh, complex uh, pattern. I'm using this the small, uh, I'm going to put the darkest dark in, full pigment. Just learning the shape here. When I do my final paintings, I'm actually going to add a tiny bit of the indigo to the cobalt so I can get a darker dark in here. So, and then the next level down would be in here. With less, um, less wa water or more water. But you basically go back and forth in this painting, getting down to paler and paler, uh, less pigment. So that's a basic little exercise that you can do get looking for the values in the shadows. Now we have a tree subject and I want to show what it can be like, the energy that you can create in your shadow shapes um, and when you actually add the washes on top, uh, these shadow shapes come out um, with a whole different influence on the paper and the painting. These exercises are just to inspire you to try. Don't need much, much more detail than that. So I'm going to go to the indigo which is really dark and look for the darkest areas. And one thing that's very important when you're using this approach is to make sure that you allow this level of the painting to dry. You might surprise yourself that you can paint over it. You can allow white passages of light which are in here to come out. You can break up the lines. Add a little water, taking the colour into it. A 
And then the, the tree itself has some shadows to it. And then there's a shadow cast down in here. So the idea is that you allow these shadows, shapes, to dry. And then you can bring a washes up to the edge of them. Um, and one of the advantages of doing this by putting your shadow shapes in first is you've got maximum contrast happening already. And I bounce off that energy. Um, when you run the washes on top of this, also you'll get some lovely broken lines, some softer lines, because the, some of the dark shadows will bleed, but you learn to control those. You learn when you want those to work and when you don't. Sometimes you paint up to them and sometimes you paint over them. But uh, I'll show you what that looks like. I'm going to put a little bit more of the hill in here. So I think you get the gist of, there's a slightly lighter one up in here. The energy that I'm producing, the contrast that I'm producing, the white paper that's being preserved where I could actually say to myself, okay, well, I'm actually going to leave an area much, much lighter. It, it helps me define the areas uh, on the page also in a very exciting way. So now, this is a still life, and I want to show you how something like this can be very, very dynamic right from the get-go. So put this, these shapes in quickly. There's a lovely shadow in here that's uh, the turquoisey colour and I might say to myself, you know, I don't want to make that my dark blue shadow shape. I'm going to wait and I'm going to put it in as the turquoise in a darker colour. And that brings variety to your painting. And part of our whole reason for painting is to bring variety and have paintings that are interesting. It's fine. So I'm finding where my shadow areas are. Uh, this is a very quick little way of describing or denoting exactly where I want to actually put my shadows. Here we go. Let's start with the indigo again. It reads almost as a black. There are patterns in here, the wheels. You don't have to be that accurate. The underneath of the wheel rim is definitely in a shadow. Now I'm putting less pigment, a little bit more light because I want variation in this. And then around the axle. And then here's something interesting with the grasses. All this will come into play because it's a, it, you've established something that you can't get rid of in, by this dark. I don't need to draw everything. I can actually use the brush to draw in. I'm using my darkest dark right now. And 
you know, outlining, join my shapes together. And then here's a good example where you can preserve your white. And there's a rim around the top of the can. And I, I don't, I, I will leave that white paper all the way through the painting. And it's the shadows connected there. So I, I know that this photograph of this scene appealed to me because of the shadows in it. But remembering I'm out in the field and I would be painting this not from the photograph, I'll be painting it from real life. And, but <clears throat> I'm establishing here in learning ahead where my shadow shapes are for when I, to inform me. Now, here's a good example where I just add water because I want it to be a lighter shadow. There's some grass in there. There's a spectacular dark shadow here. I have a, a section up there that's, again, very, very dark. And then one in here, one there, and the outside of the pipe, or whatever that is. And then there's details within. You start to look for fine, there's a, a much lighter shadow cast from the handle. And then there's a very interesting triangular sh shadow that's under the rim and then there's another interesting shadow in here as well. There is a shadow in here. I could, for the sake of this, I could just put a lighter shadow here and then run the turquoise over the top of it later. And then I have the grasses all these grasses will show up later into it and then the back in here. Anyway, so that gives you the gist of how I use the deepest, darkest tone for my darkest shadows and then I used tones to, but they're still shadows and then I would be putting all my other colours into this and uh, I mean, I'm not fleshing out all of this as well, but no, it goes up in there. Okay, this is in architecture. So, so you might ask yourself, you say, oh, do, Barbara, do you just go around looking for shadows? Do you look for interesting things? And I do now. Once upon a time, I was always motivated by choosing a subject and then painting about that. Well, I still, I've make, I now combine the two things. Um, I want to paint about life. Life is very, very important to me. Um, I sometimes refer to myself as a journalistic painter uh, because when I was working as an in, um, architectural renderer, I actually was drawing sometimes um, over a thousand houses a year for the real estate market and with that came an observation about life and about how people occupy space and how they live in it and how they farm in it, how they uh, build in it. Uh, it just was a general commentary that I would be fascinated by so that when I actually started to paint I asked myself well what do you want to paint about and I thought oh you know, I really want to paint about life and how it is. Um, I don't put people in my paintings very much um, because this is more about the objects that occupy the land. So <clears throat> very simple architectural shapes, but the point of this is again to show you how dynamic this can look by putting these shapes in now and informing me for the rest of my painting. 
I can also lift those windows that are there or I can just isolate that square that will, I can paint it next time around in a, well, I just drop the windows in there, keeping the frame of the window. It's, this is my lightest light area. I'm not convinced that that's how I want it to look. So I might just open, open this section here. And the car shape is in a shadow. So I'll put a shadow shape there. And I'll straighten that. And then I'll cast a shadow in here where the doorway is. The light will pass through and into the garage. And then this is a lighter shadow, the way I see it, going up into darks again, up in this area. Use your brush, smoosh your brush, flatten the brush bristles um, to get some of these random shapes because when you paint around them there's going to be a lot of energy in your um, painting as a result of the different brush strokes that you used. I'm going to paint down here on this side and I really like this shadow here. There's two ways of approaching this. You can lift the posts out or you can just paint around them. And then we go to the back area. And the spikes of the tree will bring out the roof line. Like that. And then if you want some more detailed shrub in here. There's some fence, fence details there. There is a post that's actually in shadow here. There's the back of the car that will do the around the tires underneath. Tire at front shape of the windows. So it's a value sketch. But in watercolour, if you're doing your, starting off with your <coughs> lightest lights and working to your darks, it's very hard to get this in on top of the wet, wet paper. And it all changes. This stays very fresh and very vibrant. So I think that's good. I want to talk a little bit about some of the dynamic shadow shapes that you uh, can have in a painting uh, by showing you a couple of examples of my paintings incorporating the shadow shapes. This was an interesting one done in Maine and uh, so at the top part that's that's the end of it. This is how it began. I'm, uh, unfortunately, there was reflected light <laughs> coming down on my surface that I took this painting, uh, a progress painting. But here you can see I actually put the shadows in, which are up at the back here, in the dark blue, and then across to the little island, and then up at the back here. And then I ran, the first wash I ran was the yellow wash at the top, and then I ran this green set of washes dropping in some uh, quin gold into them. But this had to dry before I could do this process. And then down below, is I, the girls that I was painting with, we needed to get somewhere by a certain time, so I had to leave. But it shows you the variety, the variation that I'm using um, in the... Uh, painting of shadow shapes, the different ones. Uh, this is the reference photograph that I took, which is not excellent by any means, but I, I edited and changed things to suit me. And here's this dark area, which is in here. And it's an indication. It's not 
everything that I'm doing here is an indication or an impulsive reaction to the foliage. It's not painting realistically exactly what is there. I'm the creator. So my next example I want to show is uh, was painted in the Napa and this is the tractor at the Montini uh, ranch. It was 114 degrees painting and you really couldn't be out there too long because uh, I couldn't cope with the heat. And But what enticed me here was the tractor itself, the shadows on the tyre and this lovely pattern here, the shadows through the foliage and the tree here. Then I, this was defined around so it was very nice and crisp to define the actual tractor and also to push the tractor forward. And then I had shadows underneath the turns of the wheels. Um, I had shadows on the ground. And then when I actually started, there was a shadow cast by a tree across uh, on this container. So this is where I did a one of the shadow shapes I did actually in the color of the tractor. And then I'm pulling out deeper shadows in it as I go along. Here's the shadow shapes that I put in uh, at the beginning, just defining this area. And this is where I draw through a painting. I don't draw the whole thing. I draw the important parts that I feel are going to have edges that will reflect an object standing in front of another. And so that's why I didn't put out any of this other information into the painting at this point. Um, there's a very strong shadow shape that I've put in here and just a minimal one, but I've indicated where the shadows are underneath. And then run a wash on top, which has blurred this shadow shape. This is a little better photograph, but this is also dried. So now I'm indicating but with pencil where I want the energy and the shadow shapes to be put in and I've just started to add them to the scene. And now I'm adding a wash over the um, foliage in the background and I'm not touching any more other than to put some directional lines in. And now you can see the, the great energy that, that's come. I've now put in some more shadow shapes. Here's the blue really standing out very, very well. And I've deepened the shadows underneath the tires. And there's the finished painting. So dynamic shadows can be made through brush strokes. And I encourage you not to just do the, the obvious shapes and think that it's going to be always rigid lines and clean lines. They'll be there if it's a hard square object. But as soon as you get into the foliage, pay attention to the energy and the leaves and the, the patterns that you can see. And in the tires here, we was able to pop out the ridges. Now I'd like to do a demonstration of uh, what I really truly love to do and why I am a painter. Uh, this subject matter comes from Alameda and it's a Victorian and the thing that appealed to me greatly was the casting of the shadow of this almighty huge oak tree that was very awe-inspiring and powerful and also the recognition that originally Oakland was had the largest number of oak trees in it and there are very few old 300 year old 200 year old oak trees as this example. I also wanted to record the architecture of Alameda. There's many houses that have been there since the late 1890s and this is a, a modest Victorian with uh, beautiful colouring of today so this theme or this scene gave me a chance to describe not only the magnificence of the old ancient tree but also the history of this area. So let's get down to it. This is my reference here and I'm going to transfer it onto the paper 
uh, freehand. I, I'm going to put the tree in first because the tree is the, the, the focal point around which my story is going to be told and painted about. Now I'm using the paper mate, so this is just sketching in. And then the, the house is a support, but it's also the framework upon which to bounce the um, shadow shapes off. So there was a combination of things. It, there, the shadows being cast onto this elevation did lure me in, but also the subject lured me in. And, you know, I wanted to record it down today, you know, uh, at this, this time, you know, in an era that's been quite an interesting um, time for all of us. So there's my tree. Now I'm going to actually put my uh, elevation, starting with the strong angle at the back here of the roof line. And... Eve line, and there, I don't need to put details into this at this point. There will be some of the building cast at the back. And then I'm going to plot in where the, uh, this is the portico or porch of the Victorian, which has, um, dental work, which is the little little blocks in it, but there's a sort of a nice detail in there that I'll later be able to pick out. And I'm, I am defining the architecture in this and the forms. And I'm thinking to myself as I'm doing this, um, so what, are, what other colours am I going to do? What is the order in which I'm going to paint this? I've got to preserve my whites. I don't need to fill out the detail of the door. I just need to denote where it is approximately. where the driveway comes in. This is actually the little garage that was adjacent to, but it, it's a form that gives scale to the painting. At least I think it will. And I'm thinking about um, that I'm going to, this is the reference photo that I've actually got, which is a little more realistic for to work from and better um, it's just easier to see. As you can see, there's a, a car in here and I'm just going to take that out and just imagine that there's a garden down in this section here and then I know that the, the railing floor to it probably ends there and the window is going to come in here. And then when I put the shadow shapes in, I can put in my own shadow shapes. I don't have to put in the shadow shapes that I'm seeing here. It's just a, a guide. And then there's a return. Put this to come down. Also, the architecture doesn't have to be believable. Unless I have a client who's commissioned, well, like in the real estate business, where I'm compelled to have to paint realistically exactly what a um, house looks like, I can do my own things here. I can change and move around windows. So just think of your composition and how you want it to the best you, that you want it to be. I actually want to increase this window down here. Uh, I use the edge of the paper here or the tape um, often as a straight edge 
if I want to put a straight edge in. It's just a natural guide that's there for a, a vertical line. This is all big garden bed and then I'll put the stairs in because that's going to have an interesting um, shadow on it and then I sort of go and feel some of the shapes in the tree that'll give me a guide to where there's going to be shadows that I put here and then I go across to where this is the roof line going back to the peak This is not important information at this point. I don't need that. I don't need the foliage of the tree that's going to be put on top. This is just getting in some of the big shapes. And then my shadow shape. I actually want to put a, a strong shadow coming down from the eave of the house here of the porch and I want to put some strong shapes of the tree across the window up the top and into here, continuation of that branch. There'll be a shadow here. This will be in shadow as well. Don't want to get confused by having that in the wrong spot. And then I'll want to draw another limb up here. And then another one going on this face. And then maybe some more just randomly breaking across the surfaces of the tree. and down and into here. I'm just going to correct that. You will see that. And then there will be maybe some, maybe a branch here. And then there will be a continuation of the tree going up into this section. That one's going through. That's pretty much the gist of what I want to do. Hi there, I'm Barbara Tapp and I'm an Australian but I live in Berkeley, California and I am crazy about watercolours and today I'm going to introduce you to a discovery that I made and the radical impact that it's had in, to my work. I've been painting for about 12 years and I didn't have the understanding or even the realisation uh, of approaching watercolours from the darkest to the lightest until I had an aha moment and thought to myself maybe if I put my shadows in first I can keep excitement or add excitement to my paintings and add contrast to my paintings instead of having to wait to put them in to the end. You're going to learn about sketching. I emphasize drawing in a sketchbook and having a sketchbook at any time with you where you can scribble your ideas, write your thoughts and write your intent. You're going to learn about composition, editing and how important that is, but you're also going to learn to actually isolate and identify where the blue shadow shape areas are in a painting or in a scene. The blue shapes actually allow you to see a lot of different patterns that will emerge it also is a completely different process once the blue shadow shapes have dried. You learn to put washes on top of them and then also the washes can change the colours of the blue underneath and that is an unexpected pleasure. This video is here to inspire and to open a door, to excite you to go in the field and when you're out observing to look at it differently, to look at the scene differently, to look at the picture or the still life 
in a different manner. That's why I'm doing this video, is to inspire you to open a door to your imagination. It's a lot of fun. It's an exciting part of watercolour. It's an avenue to go up and explore. Hi there, I'm Eric Rhodes. Welcome to Interviews with the Artist. My guest today is world famous watercolor artist, Barbara Tapp. Barbara, welcome. Hi, Eric. And Hi. I say world famous, you actually were born and raised in Australia. Yes, I was actually. Uh, mm, won't say how long ago, but yes, I was raised in Sydney <laughs> and uh, grew up on, on an inner harbour beach and one of four. Yeah. yeah. How did this whole art thing uh, start getting into your brain? Was this something that started to happen in childhood? Very much so. Um, I think being the third of four, my sister was a brilliant teacher and I graduated from the College of Dot to Dot Books and Coloring Books. Mm -hmm. um, we were very much a family of activities that we did uh, together, playing puzzles and lots of drawing. And then about 10 years old, um, my parents thought that I seemed to show some ability for drawing. So they enrolled me in a very, very interesting studio that was down the street from us. Very interesting, how? Because I had never seen skulls and bones and torsos or any of that sort of things and those sorts of things. And uh, I went down there and that's what I did. I drew skulls and torsos and all sorts of things like that. At 10 years old? At 10 years old. And how long did it take you to figure that out and get good at it? I, I'm, I think that the best way to think about that or say it is that I was born with a real passion for drawing. Um, it's just very natural. Uh, they sent me at 12 to an art school and I remember the aha, I did have an aha moment and I was with a lot of adults and they set up a still life and we all drew the still life and I'm looking at it and I went, oh, I've actually drawn that in really great perspective. And then I got up and walked around and looked at the other people's artwork and I knew that there was something different. Hmm. So did that drive you, that aha moment? Did it make you want to pursue it more? Oh yeah. So you were getting, uh, was it just uh, drawing? Was there life drawing? Was there instruction? Were they working with you? At this studio, yes. It was, it was an all-encompassing. So we did uh, lino prints and uh, we did pottery, uh, ceramics, a lot of those things. Uh, but I was drawn back into the art room where there was drawing and watercolour painting hmm. and painting with acrylics. And uh, from there, I actually can remember my first experience in school. And I ha had to think about that. Uh, we had Bible classes mm -hmm. and we each week we had to do the headings to the, the lesson. And I remember there was another girl in the art class with me and we both would... Um, really try to excel with our illustrations that we did. M much on the history of manuscripts, the way that the um, friars would decorate a manuscript. Right. And, and I, I know I excelled at that. The other thing is that we were given an allowance and our allowance was 40 shillings. I think it was, yeah, about that. And Derwent pencils were 20 cents or 20 shillings each. And it couldn't have been that much, but anyway, I remember I saved up 72 of these coloured pencils mm. so that I could do this beautiful artwork. It took me a long time, but yes, art became very passionate and it was the thing that I knew I was very happy to go to an art room and paint and we also had a class of very talented girls. So I, I don't know much about the art scene in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, when we don't know about these places, we assume the worst, probably. But I, I get the impression there's a pretty active 
arts community in Australia. Is that accurate, inaccurate? I think it is. Our, our schools were based on the English art schools uh -huh. and the school that I went to, which was, uh, um, and in, I did interior design and it was based on the London Slade School of Art mm -hmm. and a very strict curriculum, uh, very, very rigorous. And I think uh, Australia's also had a great appreciation for crafts. So uh, I think because of our raw natural materials and also it's a very um, fresh country, there's a wonderful light about it, but I don't know how that reflects in our artwork, but it does. Hmm. So you said something about you went on to interior design. Tell me a little bit about that. Best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. Uh, having, having endured 13 years at the same girls' Catholic school, <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I was accepted into um, a degree of interior design. Uh, I didn't quite have the academics to do architecture, but I wanted to. And mm -hmm. this was a course that was very strictly based on interior architecture. So it wasn't interior decorating. And uh, so we, had, we did industrial design and drafting, life drawing, uh, not a lot of free painting, but that's where I was first exposed other than my father who was an architect and painted in watercolor. But I had one semester of rendering and um, I did my first architectural drawing and, a, and washes in watercolour. And that, what I learnt, that skill and drafting in four years, prepared me for architectural rendering, which I did as a career. So, I would assume that the skill sets needed for interior are the same skill sets needed for exterior. Yes, no, I mean, it's perspective. It, it definitely overlaps. Yeah. Um, I mean, yes, we're interior architects and you have to understand the outer shell of a building to be able to work with the inside shell of it. We did uh, building construction for four years um, so that it also taught me how to, to read plans and elevations and that gave me an extra skill as well. My dad gave me a piece of advice, he said to me, you like money, don't you? And I said, yes. He says, you want to be a fine artist, do you? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, are you also interested in being a teacher? And I said to him, no, no, I'm not a teacher. And he said, you go and get a skill. He said, that skill, which turned out to be architectural drafting, will serve you so that you can earn money so that you can paint. Hmm. And that's what he did. Uh, no, he painted only in his spare time. I mean, he was a magnificent artist, naturally. Uh, during the war, he illustrated all his uh, time when he was in, uh, I think it was in the Sudan mm. and also in New Guinea. And I inherited all his sketchbooks. Oh, how wonderful. I know. They're really quite, they're treasure, an absolute treasure. My kids will inherit my sketchbooks, but they won't know what to do with them. But who's going to inherit <laughs> Grandpa's sketchbooks? Maybe there's enough to share them around. <laughs> well, maybe there's a museum that wants them. Ah, uh, yes. You never know. Mm -mm. So, uh, do, you, do you think that you had this interest in architecture because of your dad's career in architecture? Very definitely. I, I'm like the doctor's daughter, except I'm the architect's daughter. So, I had a grandfather who was an engineer, a father who was an architect, a brother who was an architect, an uncle who was an architect, and a husband who was an architect. Wow. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but in honesty, the, I did not have the mathematics to do architecture. Mm -hmm. um, however, in my career as an architectural renderer, I have been uh, employed many times by architects to come in and do schematic uh, conceptual illustrations for houses and for buildings. So I hear that a lot from, there's a, a, a quite a number of watercolor artists who started out as architects. Yes. And a lot of them got into fine art because they were doing so many renderings to try and show what the building would look like in, in situ, you yes. know, in, in the environment. And uh, you were doing it 
not just for that purpose, though. You were doing it for other purposes. The architectural rendering? Yes. I mean, weren't you doing, uh, the, I seem to remember that you were doing uh, renderings that were used in ads or something? Yes, absolutely. Um, the, well, there's two things that you just sort of said there, is that I think a number of architects are naturally artistic mm -hmm. to begin with. And they choose a career and an education and it happens to be architecture. Um, but there is a side of them that they want to continue into fine arts, uh, like I was persuaded not to go into hmm. fine arts. The second part is that uh, fate has had a very big part in my life and my husband met a, a guy who had a girlfriend who happened to be a writer of travel books and over dinner we discovered I was an illustrator, she was looking for an illustrator and 14 books later over a period of 25 years, I learnt a skill and I had a real estate agent who saw copies of the books that I donated to the elementary school. Mm -hmm. And one day in the street he said to me, if you can draw hotels, do you think you could draw a house? And unique to where I live, which is in the East Bay of Berkeley, um, there were five architectural renderers who were drawing houses for the real estate market. They preferred to have an illustration than to have a photograph. Well, I noticed that because I lived in the Bay Area for a while and, and unusual to most communities, a lot of the ads or in the magazines that show the houses, a lot of them were showing renderings instead of photographs. Uh, why? Why not show a photograph? Why do a rendering? Uh, and, and it seems like that's one of those things that would have started you know, generations ago, yeah. but it seems like it's something that would have been discontinued, but it does continue to this day. Yes, I, I'm still doing renderings, but I am doing color renderings now. So uh, when there was a recession in 2008, I needed to change my product. Mm -hmm. And that's when I introduced watercolor into the product. But uh, the newspaper print was not good for photography and the black and white renderings actually gave more punch in sure. the real estate section. So that was one reason. And two was that each real estate agent wanted their own personal uh, impression and then they wanted a gift. So they got two for the one. So how, how large would you make these drawings? They're nine by six. Nine by and six. I believe in quantity, uh, not necessarily an expanse and I don't go on the streets and paint. I've had a couple of encounters where I've had to go out there and it just was a, a waste of time. I, you know, I was raising three kids and you know, I had the dog, had uh, you know, all the volunteer things that I was doing and I, I needed to economize this into a system. And uh, your system was go take a photograph and then draw it from the photo? Yes, and sometimes I have 12 of them sitting around me because, you know, you can buy a house and it's bricks and mortar, but it's covered in trees. And I live in an area that is full of trees and they're down in canyons. And um, I, I have a, 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 it's very much my love of perspective. I don't use um, any devices. I have a very simple drafting platform and mm -hmm. a parallel line and I have my original set square which is a triangle mm -hmm. and I freehand these these illustrations um, so it's a very a, a, a basic way of drawing and very unique to where we live so what is it about perspective that artists continue to get it wrong oh boy um, I think it's the way we see things we can't, our brain does not understand form and doesn't understand uh, how it diminishes as it goes away from you. And so your eye will often, they can't understand this elevation versus that elevation. Mm -hmm. I, I draw instinctively, but I've also created a method of, um, it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, but it's also relationships. So when I'm drawing, I'm actually always relating whatever I'm drawing to surrounding things. Hmm. Interesting. So you, uh, at some point, you became 
a fine artist, in addition to your, your renderings, which were also very fine, I've seen them, but uh, how did you make that leap? And, and what, what was the, um, the driving force behind making that leap? I think it's the empty nest syndrome. Yeah. That's part of it. Uh, also, I had um, my middle son, Alex, uh, said to me one day, he said, why are you not painting for yourself? Why are you constantly working for other people and you haven't used your imagination or painted for yourself? And that was a big question mark. I didn't have to work as hard as I had. The kids mm -hmm. were all graduated and through college. And so suddenly I had an opportunity to change the direction or expand on the direction that I had. Mm -hmm. And so I, with some encouragement from a friend, I went and got a tiny little studio that was away from the house because I'd never had a space of my own. My, my drafting table could be anywhere, you know. <laughs> it could be on the rafters as long as I could do it somewhere. So it went from the kitchen to the living room to the back room to into a closet eventually, which is where it still is. Hmm. And I work in the closet. Um, and uh, anyway, I got this little studio in Berkeley and I called it my hole in the wall. Mm -hmm. And I went down there and sometimes I would lie on the floor in the sun and read a book. Mm -hmm. And other times I started to just paint from my imagination. And most of it came from a yearning to go home. Tell me about that. Well, the first painting I did was about abandonment. And I think it was just the mum who was, was sad because the kids had gone away. <laughs> and I painted a seashell that was a long way from the sea, that the sea was in the distance and there was this one shell. And I, when I painted it, I painted it in purples and blues and it was very somber. Hmm. I painted it a year later, the same thing, and it was full of color, full of yellows and f the most amazing, my whole life just opened in from that little studio. Now, y you, you eventually started doing plein air painting. Mm. How? Why? <laughs> Thomas Scheller, wonderful man. Um, he actually uh, let me know about an Australian, an American who went to Australia, turns out the same time as I came here. We were ships passing or aeroplanes passing yeah. in the air. Uh, Georgia Mansa. Uh -huh. And I, I took a plein air uh, class with her and I had had in that little studio and in my home <laughs> a French easel that had sat for 10 years <laughs> and I had never opened it. Oh really? And I took it down there and we went to Carmel and I'm, I, I've not ever learnt the theory of art so I didn't know what values were and I didn't know what tones were and I couldn't talk about you art. You didn't know the lingo, yeah. I did not love it, know the language and Georgia was so well organized and she literally the first day was learning these terms and learning things that I knew innately but didn't know how to verbalize what mm -hmm. they exactly were. And I was hooked. It was extraordinary. I was out of the studio, in the outdoors. I had the fresh air. I mean, it was as good as the sport. And you were making friends, you're around other people. Oh, Eric, I, it's amazing that you would say that because I didn't realize how, I'll cry, isolated I'd been. I really was. To get our, art, our artwork done and our product created, we're alone. Yeah. And um, sometimes, well, a lot of the time I slept four hours at night to get everything done. So, you started making friends how? I mean, the, these people you met on the streets in Berkeley? Yes. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. I mean, I literally will get outdoors and uh, I think painting is something that in the streets uh, people can be very um, shy about and, and don't want to approach you. On other times, there are people who just walk up to you. And w one of the things, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis after I got a tick bite, uh, which they haven't said, but this is what they th think that triggered it off um, in 2016. And I 
lost the ability to paint mm. and I, I was frozen from my torso up and had literally an hour to two hours during the day where I could go out or do something in it's the awful. middle of the day. Awful. It was unbelievable and I didn't know what was wrong but uh, I decided because of Mark Taylor's challenge that he does for Strata mm -hmm. uh, where we paint for a month every single day um, so this was January 2016 that I would force myself to get out and paint. Mm. So I went out onto the streets of Berkeley for two reasons. There was gentrification occurring in the old flatlands, the industrial area, and that really worried me. And the second thing was the shadows in winter are just they're incredible. So you wanted to document what was about to go away. I wanted to do that, yeah. exactly. And uh, as an architectural real estate illustrator, I've seen the suburbs changing. I've seen this complete turnover. And I thought, if I take just these square block areas, uh, it was a mile around, um, I might be able to tell a story of what's happening here. Hi there, I'm Barbara Tapp and I'm an Australian but I live in Berkeley, California and I am crazy about watercolours and today I'm going to introduce you to a discovery that I made and the radical impact that it's had in, to my work. I've been painting for about 12 years and I didn't have the understanding or even the realisation uh, of approaching watercolours from the darkest to the lightest until I had an aha moment and thought to myself, maybe if I put my shadows in first, I can keep excitement or add excitement to my paintings and add contrast to my paintings instead of having to wait to put them in to the end. You're going to learn about sketching. I emphasize drawing in a sketchbook and having a sketchbook at any time with you where you can scribble your ideas, write your thoughts and write your intent. You're going to learn about composition, editing and how important that is, but you're also going to learn to actually isolate and identify where the blue shadow shape areas are in a painting or in a scene. The blue shapes actually allow you to see a lot of different patterns that will emerge. It also is a completely different process once the blue shadow shapes have dried. You learn to put washes on top of them and then also the washes can change the colours of the blue underneath and that is an unexpected pleasure. This video is here to inspire and to open a door, to excite you to go in the field and when you're out observing to look at it differently, to look at the scene differently, to look at the picture or the still life in a different manner. That's why I'm doing this video, is to inspire you to open a door to your imagination. It's a lot of fun. It's an exciting part of watercolour. It's an avenue to go up and explore.